Throughout history, the generations have been defined by tragedy. We mark these moments, frozen in time, with the memories of where we stood when the news poured over us. The assassination of JFK, the explosion of the Challenger space shuttle, the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. But then, there are those moments that don't pour over us, but creep up like a flood that will not recede. For many, 2020 will be remembered as the year the world shut down, when the COVID pandemic tore apart our way of life and in the United States alone left over half a million dead in its wake. People will be left with images of shuttering in place and delivery driver heroes. They will remember video conferences, live streams, and innovations in entertainment and connectivity. Most in the world will simply wonder, but have compassion for those who endured the moments that will be recalled as the most difficult, definable times of 2020. As our friends and acquaintances thought and prayed for those who were enduring those times, our family was living them. As an executive in the sports and entertainment industry, my career field would be the first casualty, but far from the worst my family would face. With stadiums shut down and crowds barred from gathering, I would be confined to my home without strategy, plan, or guidance. Within days, the industry known for event tickets would be synonymous with pink slips. Moving up in the sports industry equates to literal moves for top executives. I was happy to be offered a greater role when so many others were just struggling to find a paycheck. But with happiness came the realization that I would be relocating my family to a new state in the middle of a pandemic. We feared added contact out in the world during the move would put us at a greater risk, but we believed a greater life warranted that risk. Not long after the move, the fear became real. Our youngest child at the time spiked a fever. It had lost his appetite, unable to keep anything down for almost two days. The process of checking your child into an emergency room is always a stressful one, but going through protocols yourself to see if you are cleared to stay with a six-year-old at the hospital was a whole nother level of scary. I was cleared to stay with him as we were quickly isolated into a private room. I watched as two healthcare workers began administering an IV and blood draw, while a third posted a caution biohazard sign outside his room. In total, we would spend two days in the hospital. It tested negative for the virus, but his symptoms in the time of COVID warranted extra attention from the doctors. Attention he needed from his mother, but could not have as only one visitor was allowed in order to reduce traffic flow and keep as many people as possible safe. But safe was still far from what we would remember of this pandemic. Nothing can top the joy we have felt during the births of our sons, but the months preparing for their arrivals comes close. The time spent finding the right items for their homecoming are, or better said, should be, moments families share forever. But when you are forced to balance the necessities of what your unborn child needs with that of family safety, the preparation becomes a chore and a challenge. Additionally, not knowing how safe your two older children will be when you go to the hospital generates anxiety and panic. Would I be with my wife or my children? Would I be putting them in more danger with a stranger? Would my wife be giving birth alone? No matter how much you succeed in life, you always need something to lean on. For us, it has been God and family. My parents worked out a plan to travel with minimal contact from Florida and join us in our new home before the baby was scheduled to arrive. Heaven sent and full of love. Having a baby is never ordinary. And in the days of COVID, extraordinary efforts were put into place to protect everyone involved. What should be one of the most comforting moments in your life is regimented and those that you need closest to you are confined to impersonal contact. Movements were limited and procedures altered to generate as little contact as possible. It was a long day, but by evening, our third child, another beautiful, healthy boy was with us. For the next 24 hours, he would not leave our side, and soon he would be home to meet his brothers and grandparents with happiness and heartache soon to be intertwined with all of us. Two weeks later, the danger that so many around the world had feared crept into our home. On Monday, November 2nd, 2020, 
I was quarantined with COVID-19 virus. I would fight the virus alone, isolated in the back room of our house for nearly four weeks. My wife would leave food outside the door and clear the hallway when I was strong enough to retrieve it. No one knew the shape I was in or how close I was to calling 911. Outside that door, my oldest son, only 10 years old, wondered if his dad was dying. During four of those days of my seclusion, the same thoughts ran through my own mind. I thought of all I would miss, and I fought off depression as I knew what I was already missing. Outside that bedroom door was my newborn son not knowing the feel of his father, a wife not knowing the support of her husband, and two young boys not being comforted and protected by their dad. What I did not know, but soon would, is there was no protection I could give them. As the virus spread through the home, everyone infected. My wife, strong and compassionate, broke the home into individual zones, not wanting to cross-contaminate family members, the new baby still not showing any symptoms. My father and mother, fearing their infection would worsen and possibly harm the baby, packed their car and prepared for a quick trip back to the comfort of their home in Florida. I would say goodbye to them over the phone, remind them to be safe, and share with them my love for them having been there. What would happen next was the darkest part of our experience, but not the end of our story. My father and mother arrived safely to their own home only to have their health deteriorate quickly. Unable to walk, first responders, heroes in everything that had been happening, were called to their residence. My father, unconscious on the floor in the kitchen. My mother, unable to hold herself up on the floor in the dining room. My mother would spend 19 days between the hospital and a quarantine care facility. My father would spend 15 days in the ICU on a ventilator. On November 30th, 2020, the day I was cleared to leave quarantine, my father was pronounced dead from the COVID-19 coronavirus. My dad was our rock and our captain, larger than life personality that impacted thousands around the world. I wasn't always wise enough to follow him, but I'm now smart enough to know to always carry him with me. Through all of this, my wife would lose her taste and smell for months. My mother would drift without direction. My older sons would fear personal contact even within our home. But this is still not the end of our story because this was not the end of our faith or our family. My brothers and I would rally behind my mother. My wife would open up her heart in our home. My sons would become roommates and mom would become a member of our household. During my mother's follow-up appointment with the doctor, she told him this has been an ordeal like nothing else we have faced. We are ordinary people, she told him, who don't live extraordinary lives. We honor our mother and our father, but she was so wrong. We are an extraordinary family, living an extraordinary life. We offer each other an unbreakable bond, and we share love like no other. We walk with purpose and share that with the world. We build, we grow, we advance, and we do it together. This tide will recede and the world will heal and we will push forward. Our COVID-19 story will not end with the fact of how we were able to take it, but what we were able to make of it. We are filled with love, faith, family, and the pioneering spirit. We are.